Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Be seated. And happy to be here tonight in the service of the King. We used to sing an old song years ago. I am happy in the service of the King. You remember that song? Wasn't that just a, a dandy? Happy in the service of the King. Uh, Anybody serving in the service of this king that we're talking about has got to be happy, hasn't he? Amen. Now, tonight, it's a pleasure to be in the little tabernacle here, the People's Tabernacle. I like that name, that title. It's to the people, all people. Amen. Everybody's welcome. I think them titles like People's Tabernacle, Church of the Open Door, House of Prayer. I kind of like that. Kind of something about it. Instead of saying it's the Presbyterian or the Baptist or the Catholic or some church like that. Well, I don't mean them churches are not all right, understand. Their titles are all right. But I'm just talking about my own feeling. I think it's the uh, it's people's tabernacle. It's the church with the open door or the house of prayer. The Bible said it is written, my father's house will be called the house of prayer. Amen. And um, so... They take that course. That don't make it any any better, any worse. It's just the names they give it. And someone has told me, said, what do you think about different denominations? And do you think if these people has and this people has and so forth? I tell you, it was a, a dean of the Lutheran College. He wrote me a letter, and he talked about giving me a good raking over. He gave me one. I was at Minneapolis. And he said, I drove 15 miles last night in a blinding snowstorm thinking I was going to hear a servant of the Lord. And what did I find but a polished up soothsayer? And he said, and your theology is, oh my, uh, it's 22 pages in the letter. And he, 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 and he said, the very idea of a man that stands before the people that you do and makes statements like you made last night. I kept on reading what I thought, I wonder what I'd say. I thought I'd go ahead and call some of them, get the tape, and check up. So he said, here's what he's getting at me for. He said, and I said the devil couldn't heal. And he said, I want you to understand, as all your brag of 25 years in the ministry, he said, son, I was preaching the gospel before you was born. So I, well, now, I thought, well, now, it's all right, I, it's okay. And he said, and uh, let me tell you why that I know that the devil can heal. He said, I live in a city where there's a woman that has a familiar spirit, you know, one of the devil spirits. And said, so people come to her for healing. And what does she do but pull some hair out of their head, pluck some of, no, she pulls hair out of her head, I believe, and plucks the veins and bleeds it on the hair from her arm, from their arm, goes down to the river behind her house and pitches it over her shoulder. And she walks up, and if she is, is constrained until she has to turn around and look at it, then the disease remains on the person and comes back. If she doesn't, said she tells the people they're going to get well. And said, we kept count of it, and said about 20% of those are healing. He said, man, you mean to tell me that you'd stand up there and have the doctor to say that the devil can't heal? Oh, I thought, well, that's all right. See, everybody's got a right to their own opinion. And I said... I just had to answer this little letter, little one. I got me the one that I was answering was going to be the little one. <laughs> I couldn't think of all that, so I sat down and I addressed him. After he first told me he thought I was a devil, see, a soothsayer, which would be a devil, of course. So he said, uh, "You," uh, I, I said, "Dear beloved brother." I was glad to get your letter. I'm always glad for friendly criticism. It helps me. It helps you if you just take it that way. If there, if somebody criticize you, you might have some spots that ought to be cleared up. I said, I'm very happy to get your letter. And you must think something of me or you wouldn't wrote to me. <laughs> I said, and then another thing that I admire you for is your 50 years of service for my Lord. And I said, I, I am certainly uh, respect that with high respect. And I said, then another thing, I said, 
you must love him or saying that the crowds that I said before and my theology I said you must uh, the thought something of the Lord and love him because you wouldn't have tried to correct me see because you love him you don't want his works going on wrong so I said you must love me and I uh, I said now the first thing I'm going to say to you I forgive you for calling me a soothsayer I said because and a devil because you remember Jesus when he was doing that very same thing saying that I can do nothing except I do what the Father tells me and was seeing the visions and telling the people what who they were and what they were and what happened and so forth the Pharisees said that was the works of the devil it was a soothsayer a Beelzebub and you know what Jesus said to them he said that you speak that against me the Son of Man I'll forgive you but when the Holy Ghost has come you speak against him it'll never be forgiven I said what if I was right just say what if I was and what have you done it will never be forgiveness in this world or the world to come according to the scriptures which cannot lie see? So, uh, now that's the blaspheme of the Holy Ghost it's called the works of God and unclean by an unclean spirit and so now I said just to straighten you up <laughs> I said I'd just like to ask you something I'm surprised that a Lutheran dean would base his theology up on some sort of an experience why I said a uh, in the Baptist church and the and the first year of school we learned to base everything upon the Bible <laughs> I said all our theology must come off the Bible and here you're trying to base your theology on an experience well I said to settle it Jesus said that the Satan cannot cast out Satan that settles it then if Jesus said Satan can't heal I don't care what anyone else would say that settles it yeah. he can't heal yeah. that's all and if you look at it he can't because the only thing can heal is when it's being made new cells develop and come back it's like you cut your hand the doctor can't heal it certainly not the medicine can't heal it. it takes God to heal it you break your arm doctor can't heal it he just sets it God heals it see because there's only one creator and if you say that Satan can create Oh my! <laughs> Where you got yourself, and you got him equal with God. See, and uh, he's a God. Then, if he can create, he can make himself. See, but he can't. He can create himself if he if he could. But he can't create. He can just pervert what God has created. And um, so then uh, he can't heal. And uh, I said, but now to answer your give you to my opinion of your answer to your question that she was condemning me on. I said, that reminds me a whole lot of uh, things that's going in the world today, Pentecostal fantastics. <laughs> I said, certainly I believe that people were healed. I believe everyone that comes approaching will be healed. And I said, but it isn't the witch that's doing the healing. No more than it is these fellows say, I got healing in my hand. Feel it, feel it, feel it. No, you don't. You might feel her hand, but you don't feel any healing. It's a finished work. It's already done. See? So it, and uh, all these different things that they do. I said, I don't believe those souls ever heal anybody. And I don't believe the witch ever healed anybody. But what brings the healing is the individual's faith thinking they're approaching God through that witch. And God's got to honor faith. I don't care where it's at. Right. See? So it's their faith thinking they're approaching. I've seen heathens kneel at idols and get healing. See? Sure, divine healing from God to the idol. But it's their faith they believe that God is in the idol and they got faith and they believe it and God's got to recognize that faith because them things are based upon faith. Healing is not based upon your works or your good deeds or your experience of Christianity and upon your salvation of your soul. Healing, I've seen people come through the line with renowned saints, go right off the platform sick yet. I've seen ill-famed people walk through and be healed with blinded eyes and everything. It's based upon your your faith, not upon your religion, not upon your experience. It's on faith. So last time over there, I'm like, he wrote me a letter back and said, Mr. Branham, I hear you're coming back to the Christian Businessman's International Convention to speak. I said, could I have a few words with you? I referred him to the manager. The manager told him, all right. So when he got there that morning, here he was. 
<coughs> so I went back out to the college. Beautiful place way out there. And when we went in, he had dinner set for us. Or you all call it lunch here. <laughs> Down south, if I call it lunch, I, I miss a meal. <laughs> and it's breakfast, dinner, and supper to me. I, I just, so we, this, was, this was dinner time for us. And so we went out there and he had a great, oh, beautiful place. Hundreds of acres where the students could work their way through and so forth, pay their tuition. And he had 70-something students sitting there. And as we had our dinner, he said, I want to ask you a question, Mr. Graham. I said, yes, sir. I thought, oh, well, here it comes, Lutheran demons. He said, I've been down to the Pentecostal and see him kick the furniture around and everything like that, but I won't ask you if anything to it. I said, yes, sir, there is. I said, like a little kid, when he gets a toy, he just falls. And I said, like Ezekiel said, there's a valley full of dry bones. He said, can these live? <laughs> he said, thou knowest. So he said, prophesy to the dry bones. And when the bones come together, there's a rattling and a shaking, <laughs> a lot of noise. <laughs> but then when the skin come on and the meat come on, there wasn't much noise. He said, prophesy to the spirit now. <laughs> I think that's what's going on. <laughs> so I said, they, I see them make a lot of noise. I said, I think the bones are coming together. And so he said, uh, we're hungered and thirsting for God. And I said, that's fine. He said, and we want you to tell us how to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. He said, now, said, we believe that, that in, we receive the Holy Ghost when we believe. And I said, well, did you ever read Acts 19? <laughs> and he said, yes. I said, well, it's mighty fine Baptist up there. I had a good pastor, a good preacher. His name was Apollos. He was a converted lawyer. He's proven Jesus the Christ of the Bible. I said, Paul passed the area upper coast of Ephesus. He finds certain disciples and he said to them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? They said, We don't have word be any Holy Ghost. See? So after that was done and they baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, and Paul laid his hands up on them, and then they received the Holy Ghost. He said, But Abraham believed God, Brother Branham, and it was imputed to him for righteousness because he believed. What more can a man do but believe? I said, That's all a man can do. I said, you believe and accept Christ as personal Savior, that's your faith. But remember, God gave Abraham a seal of circumcision as a confirmation of his faith. Amen. That's right. And I said then, and that was the Old Testament. In the New Testament, when we say we believe, God gives us the baptism of the Holy Ghost, which is a seal of confirmation. Amen. See? Ephesians 4.30 says, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed until the day of your redemption. Amen. It's a seal that God has recognized your faith. But if he hasn't given you the Holy Ghost yet, he's never recognized your faith. See? So he said, We want the Holy Ghost. Oh, oh yeah, Lutheran God. I said, What's the Lutheran people going to say? He said, We don't care what the Lutheran people say. We want God. Praise well, I said, Wonderful. Uh, I said, When do you want? He said, Right now. <laughs> I said, Well, scoot back to your place and I will pray. And I had them all go around to the wall like that, laid hands on them, and 72 Lutheran students received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. They got signs and wonders and healings going on in the Lutheran college in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Oh, he's wonderful. It's not just for you Pentecostal people. It's for the Lutheran, the Baptist, the Presbyterian. Whosoever will, it's for all. The only thing we just... The thing of it is, I think what we need is to get ourselves in control and just quit scattering and jumping and respect the gifts of God and things and put them in their places like that and let the Holy Spirit operate the church and then them other people go to hunger and thirsting for it. But as long as you let it just run loose and this one this way and that one that way and no control, they just think it's a bad one. They talk better than that in the Bible. It's not the gift that they've got against us, the way you loosely use it. That's what it's against. Jesus said, you're the salt of the earth. But the salt can only be a savior as it contacts. So you've got to make a contact. And your life is the best thing to make a contact with anybody. Amen. I'd rather you live me a sermon than preach me one any time. Right. <laughs> the rest of the world will the same thing. Well, now for just a few minutes, my wife's in the building and she looks straight at me and she knows that I preach too long and calls people to stand up. And I just... Somehow or another, I don't know, Brother Jackson, I just don't know when they quit. I'm just a glutton on the spirit, I guess. So I'm, I never did like to try to go to work of a morning when I worked hard 
and somebody set me out a little dish of cornflakes about back then. <laughs> I can just couldn't thrive. I worked hard. And I had to have something, some biscuits and some sorghum molasses and a chunk of ham meat and, and I was a top of <laughs> so I, 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 that's the way I, I like to eat. And if I'm going to work, and if I'm going to live for God, I like to have a good square four hour meal once in a while, you know what I mean? Just come right out and get the Bible and lay right with it. But we Southerners down there are kind of used to that, but we know that you Yankees up here are more of a cultured type. <laughs> so we uh, we know that. I tell you, I'd sure like to live up here, though. That's right. I sure love this country. Beautiful and the snow real dry, and, and you just hear it crunching under the wheels when you your car going. I just think of back when I was a little boy when we used to have snow down southern Indiana like that, but. The world must be a little out of its orbit now somewhere. She isn't working just right. And we, I believe it's the close the coming of the Lord Jesus. And everything's topsy-turvy. One thing that ought to be straight and running straight is the church of the living God. Amen. Amen. So let us bow our heads a moment just before we approach the word now. When we lay aside of our little things, of a little get-together, a little as it was a handshake or something, now we're going to approach God now. Our Heavenly Father, in the name of thy beloved Son, we come asking this petition, who said, when he was here on earth, if you ask the Father anything in my name, I'll do it. Now we're so happy for that. And he said, when thou prayest, believe that you receive what you ask for, and you shall receive it. And I thank thee for this, for it's a promise of God. And every promise in the book belongs to every believer. So I thank thee for it. And I pray tonight, as I have laid back these pages of this sacred book called the Bible, I'm only able to physically to open it up, but only the Holy Spirit can interpret it to us. So we pray that he will come tonight and interpret the word in the meanings that would create faith for the salvation of souls first and for the healing of bodies next and for the bringing of joy to the saints, and establish the man that they might continue on. <coughs> Grant these blessings, Father, and the forgiveness of our sins, as we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> the Word is just such a wonderful thing. I love it. And now, to announce what we call for a text for just a little while, and uh, I... And then read some of the scripture here for to get a context. I'm going to my text tonight is God keeps His word, and I wish to read from Saint John, the twelfth chapter and the thirty-fifth verse beginning. I like to hear you all turning those pages and things. I, I like to see uh, people bring their Bibles to church, and um, it means that just if I read His word. Now, my word will fail because I'm a man. But if I, we get no more out of the service tonight just reading this word together, we'll be blessed Amen. because we'll feed that much on the word of God. His words will never fail. Amen. He can't fail. God himself. At the 35th verse, Then Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while you have the light lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not where he goeth. While you have the light, believe in the light. May I stop here just a moment and quote that over again. While ye have light, believe the light. That Ye may be the children of light. These things spake Jesus, and departed, and hid himself from them. But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. <clears throat> now, while I go into the context of this in a few moments, now Jesus had done many miracles as he seen the Father show him what to do. We got that last night, did we? 
Nothing but what the Father told him to do. Now, 38th verse. That the saying of the prophet, that the saying of Isaiah the prophet, might be fulfilled, which is spoke, the Lord who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed. Therefore they, therefore they could not believe because that Isaiah said again. <coughs> Notice that? They could not believe because Isaiah said. But he heard years before this. He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts that they should not see with their eyes nor understand with their heart and be converted and I should heal them. Amen. I may the Lord add his blessings to this word. Did you notice here how strange that read? That these people could not believe because Isaiah, a prophet, had said so. Did you catch it? Now, do you know that that a, the word of God once spoke, it can never be taken back, and the word of God is so perfect, so here that John was trying to explain it to the people, that Isaiah had prophesied, saying, Who has believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Isaiah 40, chapter. And he said, Again, Isaiah said, See, who has believed our report? Who believed it about the Lord Jesus? Who, who accepted it, the report that he was the Messiah? And then he said again over here, Isaiah said, that he has hardened their hearts, see, blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, unless they should see with their eyes and understand with their hearts and be converted. Now, because Isaiah said that, had spoke that, about 800 years beforehand, that had to come to pass. Amen. The how perfect the Word of God is. Amen. No matter how much they wanted to believe, they couldn't believe, because Isaiah said they couldn't. See? Now, how, you think Isaiah cursed the people like that? No. But by seeing a vision, which God had already knew before the foundation of the world by foreknowledge, and Isaiah looked in and seen what was coming, and Isaiah reported what God had said before the foundation of the world. For this word here tonight is only what God said before the world was created. And the, a prophet is called a gift of knowledge. Many times a prophet is referred to in the Bible as an eagle. An eagle can go higher in the air than any other bird. Because he's, he's built, he's a heaven bird. He sails way above. He has it all to himself. There's no other birds around him. And he goes way high. And being high up, he can see far off. And his eagle eyes, unmatched with any other bird, can never match his eye. The hawk has got a chance, see, when he, uh, to the eagle. Because the eagle can look far away. Well, when you're high up, he can see far away. Then when you come back down, you can tell what is ahead of us. If we're traveling that way. And God takes his eagles of the Old Testament there, and he raises them up. And let them see far off things that's coming. Then when they come down, they can predict what they see. You understand now? Yeah. They're eagles. And I guess many of some of you scholars here have read Peppermint's Early Ages and a lot of those in Preacher and Prayer. And so I was wondering one time when I was at the Cincinnati Zoo in Cincinnati, Ohio, I seen a sight that struck me of uh, being that I'm a lover of nature. I love animals. Uh, I was a game warden for years, and I love nature, and I love to study the, the habits of animals and everything, because I, I, I love them. They're the creation of God, and um, he's uh, given to us. So uh, watching that, and I was studying the eagle, and I seen a sight one time that broke my heart, and it was an eagle that had been caged. He'd been caught somewhere in a trap. And he was just put in the cage, and he didn't understand why he should be caged up. And that eagle would get back, and he'd set those big wings, and he'd hit that cage, and the feathers would fly when he plopped his big wings against the cage. 
So they'd knock him backwards. He'd raise up and shake his head and fly again. He'd fall on his back and look upwards and his eyes look around. There he was, as in a cage. Mankind had caged him. A super race to him had caged him. And his, he was a heaven bird. And he looked through those bars and longed to soar with his big mighty wings. What could he do with them anymore? He, he looked into the heavens. It was a sad sight to see that eagle. But I've seen a sadder sight than that. And I've seen the sons of God caged down in denominations and under barriers and isms till they know that there's something in them that would like to spring forth. They were made to be sons of God. But a super person, the devil, has tied them down in such places so they just roll their heads and wonder, there is a fountain somewhere. Oh, if I could reach to it. That's the saddest side I ever seen. Man who is made to be sons of God, and yet let the devil tie them down under their God-given privileges. Satan has trapped them and put them into a place that says, the days of miracles is past. There's no such thing as divine healing. All that things that passed long years ago. That's a sad sight to see a man in that shape when God made him in his own image to be as free as a heaven-soaring child of the living God. Spread forth his wings and rejoice and flop in the breezes. I've seen him on his tester big wings like this, not flop around. Just set their wings and ride the tide as it comes in. The wind to come in, they just know how to set their wings and ride on up. And they go so high till he... Uh, just like a little black dot into the heaven. See? He didn't, he didn't strain. He didn't study. He didn't go from seminary to seminary, from church to church, or from mission to mission. He just set his wings. Moved with the current. As it rode, he rode up with it. And went right on out. How that man tonight would just take God's word and not try to add anything to it or take anything away from it, but just set your faith right in the wings of God, right in his word. Just ride as the Holy Ghost lifts you up above the, all this old chatter, chatter, days of miracles is past, and there's no such a thing as divine healing, there's no such a thing as the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and, and if you study that, you lose your mind. Just look right straight to the word of God and ride away on the wings of faith. Amen. Your eagles of the day. God keeping his word. And Jesus said that heavens and earth will pass away, but my word shall never fail. Amen. Now that settles it. And now in saying this, I'm only bringing this to this little church as a few moments ago before they come pick me up. I said to my wife, I believe I'll give testimony tonight of some experience. And I thought on that. And then the Holy Spirit seemed to say, give the church this little warning. Set this in this way. So I want to be obedient. Now, I have nothing against anybody's beliefs. Nothing against the, any denomination or church or anything. But there's a lot of stuff going on on the television and the radio today that ought not to be. And that's this Bishop Sheen. And those on those programs are nothing against the Catholic. If he wants to be a Catholic, that's his business. See? But uh, that's up to him. But when a man will stand on the, in, in the sacred place of God and say to try to live as the Bible is like walking through muddy water. And if the, who wrote the Bible? I guess God take notice gave you a Bible, so he wrote it on some paper and give it some angels, and they come down from the quarters of heaven and give it to you. And this says it's a bunch of epistles was written 400 years after the death of the apostles, and they're not accurate and things like that. And it, you know the Catholic Church, I'm from a Catholic family. The Catholic Church does not, they accept the Bible, certainly. But here's what they say, that God is in his church, regardless if the church says something that's contrary to the Bible, take the church's word. Now, I, I had a discussion with a priest in my dining room here just recently, and he said, I was talking about uh, baptizing a girl. He asked me how I baptized her by immersing in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, the Catholic Church used to do that. I said, when? 
He said in the early days. I said, what early days? He said the early days of the Catholic Church. I said, how early was the Catholic Church? Which I had all the sacred histories laying there, the Fox Book of the Martyrs. I had the uh, Pemberman's early ages. I had all the Josephus writing and all the other historians right there. And I, I said, I'd like to ask you, when? He said, well, the first apostles. And I said, you say they were Catholic? He said, they were. I said, is the Catholic Church a universal church? He said, it is. I said, the very word Catholic means universal, doesn't it? He said, it does. Well, I said, why is it then that the teaching of the Catholic Church today is so contrary to the Bible? He said, well, you believe the Bible, we believe the church. Well, I said, there's no way at all. We, he said, well, God is in his church. I said, the Bible said God is in his word. Amen. 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 Right. Amen. And also the Bible said in the closing of the book, he that will take out of here anything or add anything to it, the same will be taken of his part of the book of life away from him. So I believe the Bible infallibly. I believe it's the infallible word of God. I believe there's no more to be added to it or anything to be taken away from it. I believe that that is God's blueprint to his church. Amen. We builders have made a mess out of it. I'll admit that. But that has nothing to do with the blueprint. It still remains just the same. Amen. It's God's Bible, and I believe it to be God is in his word, and God is responsible to his word. Now for a little context, to go back to get a background to the things that I, I want to say, and the reason I've always tried to stay on the Bible. <coughs> I've went into churches many times, just so you'll get a, a little general picture. And I've went into churches, and you watch this. You go into a church, and you'll find usually the way that pastor acts, that's the way his congregation acts. Right. See? I believe they get one another spirit instead of the Holy Spirit sometimes. Well, that's possible. Absolutely. You take a real good woman and marry her to a no-count man, he'll either become a gentleman or she'll become no-count. See? You just take one another spirit. You do. Birds of a feather flock together. And your spirit beings. That's what's meant. Put television out the way it is now, an uncensored program of all this vulgarity and everything. Let a little boy go to the gate of the eye to the soul, the eye of the gate to the soul, brother. Let him go in and let these little girls go into one of these movies or something there and see one of these here women out of Hollywood with eight or ten husbands making love to some man. That little girl will practice the same thing the next day. Let some fantastic nonsense come out out there with some kind of little old scandal looking skirts on or something other like that and watch the American women go to wearing the same thing. That's right. See, you catch each other. What you feed on. Let me go in your office, sir, and you tell me you're a Christian. And let me hear your, you turn on your radio when I'm in there and you're listening to some kind of old boogie-woogie music. And let me see half-dressed women pin up on the side of your wall. I don't care what you say. I know what your spirit's feeding on. That's right. That's exactly right. See, always, I'd rather have an old home with no rug on the floor and with uh, a little old iron bedstead sitting there and an old dresser somewhere or whatever, a little old kitchen table made out of boxes with a sign hanging on it, God bless our home, and all the fine homes in the world, you pin up the nonsense that you have today, and a Bible laying on the table instead of all these old love story magazines and things laying around of dirt and milk and bust and everything else that's laying in the children. How can we expect anything else but a bunch of infidels and agnostics to answer out? That's true, friends. Bring up a child in the way that should go. Teach him all the word of God. Abraham Lincoln, until he was a grown man, had two books. One of them was the Bible and the other was the Fox Book of the Martyrs. Abraham Lincoln. And he studied that so honey, he read. He, he concentrated on that. That's what developed that kind of character that Abraham Lincoln was. Show me what you read. Show me what you listen to. Let me know your songs you like best. I'll tell you what's in your soul feeding on it. By their fruits you shall know them. Yes. You're right. Go into some of the places to eat. And that rattly juice box nonsense. I went in there many times and asked the man if I'd done sound or my dinner before I know that the thing was in the house. I go, I said, Mister, how many records will that thing play an hour? You tell me, I say, here, just a plug. I'll, I'll pay you right now if I get through eating. I, I want to eat and, 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 and decent. <laughs> and I said, I'll unplug the thing. If you just, if please keep that thing off while I try to eat back there, will you? 
And I'll pay you every record that they can play. If you play one just every two, three minutes, I'll, I'll make every one of them right, see, while I'm in here. Oh, such nonsense. Mm -hmm. And of all that. Now, that's the reason America's where she's all worm-eaten today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the reason the very foundations is eat out from under it. Mm -hmm. Now, you say people are just a canker eat into them like that. How can you ever tell them people of the supernatural? The only thing to hear at church is some little doxology or something other, or something about who's going to be the next mayor, and never the word of God. Right. See? If it is, it's in some little baby mile form like a little baby aspirin to an adult. See? It doesn't ease the pain of a, of a heart sick human being. That's right. You've got to have something that's God hypo. Amen. It's seemly. You know, he was called the lily of the valley. And the lily is where we get opium. Opium comes from the lily. Now I'm telling you, if your heart's sick and worn out and tired of sin, just let God give you the opium from the lily of the valley. Amen. And you'll find out it'll ease every pain and every fear. It'll set your heart looking towards God and respect to his word and believe with all your heart. Right. Now for a background, in the Bible, we're going back over into... First Kings, just for a little bit, in our mental uh, conditions to let our mind drift back to a certain uh, event. There was King Ahab of the Old Testament, which King Ahab in his time is a beautiful type of the, the New Testament. And notice, just as Ahab married Jezebel, an idolater, and brought idolatry into Egypt, well, the type in the, the seven dispensations of the Old Testament as the seven candlesticks of the New Testament in the Dark Ages, the 1500 years of Dark Ages, Protestantism made Romanism and brought idolatry into the church just the same way. Amen. Watch the Bible and see if it doesn't say that. Amen. That's right. Through that 1500 years of Dark Ages, they come out with a false baptism, sprinkling the false name, false everything else. And God said, you have a little light and you have a name, but you've denied mine. And see, yeah. so that's the same thing. And they have this lukewarm, borderline, backslidden Israelite. Oh, he might have been circumcised to the flesh. He might have had his name on the book somewhere as an Israelite. But in his heart, he thought more of that little painted face Jezebel than he did of the kingdom of God. And how many tonight, how many people have sold out their birthright to the things of the world and got away from God? Stay with the Word. That's the reason coming into a meeting, talking about taking one another's spirit. Coming into a meeting, we like to stay right with the Word. Stay with the Word so that the Spirit of the Word will be on the people. Amen. Not the Spirit of some fantastic or some minister or something. That we have to answer for at the day of judgment. Well, when I stand there that day with the uh, people that I preach to around the world, I will one thing that it and try to project something of my own, my fantastics into them people, but I stay with God's word so that thing will lay right there before me and I say, God, you were the one who wrote it. See? Amen. That's the kind of a spirit you want. Something that will take the word of God and not a bunch of fantastics Amen. and a bunch of theology that's man-made. Stay with God's eternal word. Amen. Now, Elijah, the great mighty prophet, had prophesied and he told Ahab because he killed Naboth and what was going to happen to him how that the dogs licked his blood and so forth, and he told Jezebel what was going to happen to her. Then uh, along after the going away of Elijah, God always, from Genesis to Revelation, God has always had at least one man that he could put his hand on. He's never been without a witness. And along came a young fellow by the name of Micah, a little prophet. He was hated of the others. And Ahab, and, well, he thought maybe the Jewish religion was, was all right. Now, that's the way the modern believer believes it today. They just take it as something that just, well, it just happens to be that way, see. And they go to church because, you know, it's a decent thing to do. But that's all you go to church for. You're just a hypocrite. That's all. You don't go to church for and think it's a decent thing to do. You go to church to worship God. Amen. 
You go to meet God, to thank Him and to praise Him and to worship Him. A house of worship. Now that's what we need. And then Ahab, he had him a bunch of prophets that he had well schooled and had them with the, all the best theology that they had in that day. He had taught them. And there was many of them, 400. And um, he had them all well dressed and well fed and taken care of out of his uh, kingdom. He fed these fellows up. He said, well, now, wait a minute. If I ever get in trouble, well, perhaps maybe I have to run down and find my pastors and they would, they would console me in the way. So one time Jehoshaphat, which was the son of a righteous man and a righteous man himself, he came down to see Ahab, and there's where he made his fatal mistake. Listen, oil and water don't mix. And many times, many a good life has been completely wrecked by your associates. Amen. Show me your company, I'll tell you who you are. Yes, amen. That's right, it's an old proverb, but it's a true one. Associate with people who believe God. Amen. Don't let your children, if he runs across the street to little Oswald over here, and he's a nice little boy, but be careful who little Oswald is. Yeah. Why not what his daddy is, what his mama is? They may be a hater of the gospel. Right. They may have everything projected into little Oswald. And you let your little boy or girl associate like that, the first thing you know, he'll come up and be like little Oswald. Uh, you know that's right. Amen. Watch your associate. Keep your company clean. Don't go in the pool room with that boy just because you think you can win him to Christ. If you can't win him to Christ in the church or out your own home or sitting in your car, you'll never do it in the pool room. Amen. I tell you, you're on the devil's ground. Stay away from it. Amen. Right? Separate yourself. God said, come out from among them. Amen. And be separate, says God. Then I'll receive you. Amen. God's looking for somebody who's got the the courage to stand for it. God's always wanted that. And every man of God that's ever stood from Genesis to Revelation and from Revelation to this modern time has disagreed and set himself apart from the world ecclesiastical system. That's the churches of the world in their day. Any of them, you search through the scriptures and search through the history and find out. Martin Luther, John Wesley, St. Calvin, Knox, Finney, Sainty, whoever it might be. Just look at them, how they come from among them things and stood alone upon their convictions, God's servant. And sometimes even in your own family, you'll have to stand alone. Sometimes your mom and papa will disagree with you. Sometimes Andy and uncle, sometimes your lodge members will disagree with you. If God's word you're standing on that, stay if you stand alone Amen. on God's word. For every man that ever married to a hill of beans stood on God's word with his testimony. Amen. That's right, because it's the only way to be um, to make the goal. Mm -hmm. Now, this your fellow Jehoshaphat come down, because Ahab invited him down to kill oxen, sheep, and had a great big blowout. A lot of times we get in trouble around these big what we call blowouts. These big social affairs. Well, they have their parties and all their carrying on and so forth. And when they did this, uh, maybe Jehoshaphat got a few extra steaks and a few glasses of uh, gin or whatever they had to, to drink down there. And they had said, now I'm going up to Ramoth Gilead, Gilead, and I want you to go with me. Well, Jehoshaphat is all under the influence of the big fine things. and the refined. That's the way the devil does. He shows you the bright side. And that kind of a bright side, if it doesn't tell you that God's word is a mirage. Yeah. You know what a mirage is. It's something that looks like it is. It's an optical illusion. So it isn't there when you get there. You go go down the road, it looks like water. When you get there, there's no water. That's the way the devil does it. He's always a promising something out yonder, out yonder, yeah. showing you something bright when you get there, it's never that way. Stay with the word, you're on the line, man. Amen. Amen. You're God's blueprint. Stay right there. What God says, no matter what it looks like, you don't say Faith is not what you see, it's things you don't see. You confess the things that you don't see. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, then notice, as uh, this all taken place, the uh, first thing you know, Jehoshaphat signed an alliance and joined himself up with that great people down there of Israel. When he was a, or not just got it, he was a believer, and he said, now, nah, but he was religious enough and had enough righteousness about him so he said, we had better consult the Lord before we go up to Ramoth Gilead. 
And he said, oh, he had said, oh, so he, yeah, that's right. Uh, oh, we, we, we probably should do that. So he says, now, you know what? I've got a bunch of the best deities down here that you've ever seen. But I tell you, our church has no nitwits in it. We are of the better class. We got the best class that there is. While we got a uh, man down there who is has D D P H D L L D. Why you want to see? God said, "Well, let's bring him up here." So the kings got on the thrones at the gates, and four hundred prophets come up, and one of the great big ones called Zedekiah. He comes up, you know, and he says, "Now let me see. Let us prophesy." Yes, thus saith the Lord. What up? The Lord's with you. See why they were paid good. They wasn't paying no attention to the word. They were paid well. They were fed well. They had meal tickets. And a many good man today makes a mistake there. Brother, I'd rather lay on my stomach, drink branch water and eat soda crackers and stay in God's word and tell the truth than to have fried chicken three times a day and live in a palace. Amen. Right. Yeah. It's the truth. Amen. Right, you're a dwarf jack, not dwarf jack, but bit in the heart of Michigan. When old man John Ryan, not the John you know with the long beard, but the one from Fort Wayne, that was healed in the meeting. And they take you away that rabbi. And he said, How did that man John receive his sight? I said, The Lord Jesus Christ gave him his sight. The rabbi said to me, He said, Now he wasn't either Jesus, he might have been Jesus, but he wasn't no Christ. And there we had it, right down. He said, oh, you Gentiles can't chop God in three pieces and give him to us. See? Amen. And uh, I said, well, we don't chop him in three pieces, sir. He said, there's one God. I said, that's correctly, correctly. And then he said, he got gone talking like that. And he said, said, Jesus is a thief. Now I said, a thief? He said, yes, sir. Your scripture, what you call the New Testament, said he went through the corn field on the Sabbath day and stole corn and gave it to his disciples. It wasn't even legal. But you know that. And said, you're, they're so confused. He said he stole corn and gave it to his disciples and he did himself. That makes him a thief in my way of sin. I said, just a moment, Rabbi, I'm surprised that you, your own Levitical law said that a man can go through the field and pluck and eat what he wants to, but don't take any out in the bag. That's right. I said, shame on you. I don't know the scriptures no better than that. I said, he was absolutely keeping the law. Amen. Exactly right. So I said, what the, who was Isaiah speaking of when Isaiah 9, 6, when he said unto us, the son is born and the child is given? Who was he speaking? The Messiah? Yes, sir. I said, when the Messiah comes, what's he going to be then? A child is born. He said, well, the Messiah will be a child. Mm -hmm. And he'll be born of a virgin. Yes, sir. But not that you're talking about. I said, no, I'm just asking and answering my question. And he went ahead like that, went on like that. I said, then what if the Messiah, what relationship is he going to be to God? See? What's going to be the difference between the Messiah and God? What relationship is he going to be, God? I said, there's only two things that your laws condemn him on was breaking the Sabbath and making himself God. And I said, he was the Lord of the Sabbath and he was God. Amen. I said, God was in Christ right now. Jehovah God was manifested in flesh and his son Christ Jesus to take away sin. Amen. Yeah, I see he got him, that's right. He said, well, about this man's eyes, did you do that? I said, no, sir, Jesus Christ did it. I said, John's a seeing is He said, yes, he sees it. I'll give him arms many times. I said, there he was, sitting blind, 20 years, beggar. And here he is now, can read finer print than I can. And I said, now what about that? Something gave him his eyesight. I said, Jesus Christ done it. I seen him, he turned his head around like that, and the tears running down his cheeks like that off his gray, uh, turning gray beard. And he turned his head and walked away like that, walking to one side. And I said, just a minute, Rabbi. He said, I'll see you later. And I said, just a moment. You be a gentleman with me. I want to ask you something. You believe that that was the Messiah? He looked around at me and said, Mr. Branham, I will admit that he was a good man. Well, he done hung himself right there, see. And I said, you say he was good? Yes. I said, what about his word? He said he was a prophet. <laughs> I said, Rabbi, you believe he was the Son of God? I uh, said, so first thing, if he's a good man, you couldn't believe him as a liar and a prophet, he wouldn't be a liar. And he said, I'm the Son of God. Amen. Now you've got yourself somewhere in trouble. 
He said he was a good man and a prophet, and you have to admit his word was prophecy, and he said he was the Messiah of God. That's right. And I said, now you believe. And he said, look, look over that little place towards there, Denton Harbor. He said, if I taught that, I'd be down there in that street begging. Of course, he was a Jew, you know, with money. The one that says what prophet is, is throw Joseph in the ditch. They, all right, let's sell him, get some money out of it. But he had his name on that big uh, go around that school. I said, but Rabbi, I'd rather be down there of uh, picking up breadcrumbs around the garbage can, which I wouldn't have to do it if I served God. But I said, I'd rather do that than to have my name on that building there and in my heart know I was wrong in the sight of God. Amen. I'd rather do it. God's word stands first. Amen. Amen. Right. Notice. Now, all these preachers said, Why, well, go on up, King. Why, well, sure. The Lord is with you. Why, well, you took care of us. You've built fine churches. You've made us a great denomination. You're, why, well, just look how we prospered. Under your money, why, well, sure, the Lord's with you, King. Go up. That's the way people are today. They look at their fine church. They're well scholars, polished up. Preacher they got in the pulpit sometimes. And he might be a real gentleman. He might be a servant of God. He might be polished up and still a servant of God. I don't say that, but there's too many of them on the other side as polished up and denies the word of God. Amen. That's the one I'm talking about. Not the real genuine brother. No, sir, it's the other side. Well, we belong to certain, certain church for every brand. Of course, we cannot cooperate in a, a healing campaign or something another or any things like that because, uh, well, of course, you know, the, yeah, the king would stand, <laughs> the king, yes, sir, <laughs> the king over your group wouldn't stand good for it. He wouldn't, he wouldn't, he wouldn't endorse it. You'd be excommunicated if you cooperated in it. Some great man here not long ago said, the only thing I have, the only man that ever I seen it was had enough conviction to stand on what was true was Rufus Mosley. <laughs> That's right. You, better, you know Rufus Mosley. Down in Macon, Georgia, oh, one of the great fundamental schools there with thousands in there. He said, I don't care what you say. This is a God. Brother, God shook the country around there too. And what he did, he had conviction like Martin Luther. He had conviction like John Wesley. And he, any man that's got convicted of the Word of God, not in some fantastic, but in the Word of God and placing it in his time. Exactly where it's to be. Now, notice what's taking place. Then I saw all these prophets begin to prophesy. Oh my, this is it. Dr. Jones, what do you think about it? Amen. Brother Levinsky, that's exactly right. That's the day of the Lord. Well, uh, Dr. What do you think about it? Yes, sir. Amen. Well, now, uh, I'm the head of it, Zedekiah, and, uh, and you're the secretary, and you're the chief man, and you're the state president, and you're the, what you call it now? Now, what do we all say? We will agree. That was very fine. But it wasn't according to the word. And Jehoshaphat was spiritual enough to know that. I see you have walk course, and I see Jehoshaphat. I know you're just a little bit on the queer side, I see. Because you're just a little ragged in your religion. But you're hundreds of prophets standing here. The finest scholars in the country saying we're going up. Now I see we don't have nothing to worry about. Jonathan said, but hadn't you got one more? <laughs> one more? Well, what the whole organization says, go on about it. The whole organization says we're right. All the doctors and all of them, they were right. Seems to me like I read where the Lord... Hey, have you just got another one? <laughs> He said, I got a boy roller out here. <laughs> uh, Everybody was just an outcast, all friends. <laughs> he said, he's the son of Emily. His name is Micah. But said, I hate him. Oh, sure you do. So he won't join my group, but I don't blame him. <laughs> so, oh my, I said, he is radical. And he never says anything good against him. Now that lets the cat out of the bag right there. Yeah. See the reason they said that? So he never says anything against him. How could he say anything good against him? There was, 
uh, uh, good for him because he was no good to begin with. God had condemned him and rejected it. And how are you going to bless what God has cursed? Or how are you going to curse what God has blessed? Another old false prophet tried that one time. When he brought all this big uh, denomination out and set them up there, fundamental to the dot. Yes, sir. Seven altars, seven sacrifices, set clean blocks, and the seven rims, speaking of the coming of the Lord Jesus the first time. There set a bunch of holy rollers down there at the bottom, in the name of Israel. There's a little bunch of interdenominationals down there dwelling in tents, and more was a great fence, thin country, all the celebrities standing there, and just as fundamental as he was. Right. But he failed to see that smitten rock and that pillar of fire going before Israel. That's what he said. He seen that supernatural God working in the shot of a king in the camp. He failed to see that. Now I'm afraid today that a lot of our great big celebrity fails to see the hand of God moving amongst that bunch of radics they're talking about. I know they got radics and everything, but I'll take my way with them. I'll put my charts down there if I have to take sides. It'll be right there. Louis Petras told me not long ago, I see him carry on everything to you, Brother Brown, but said I went with him so I could bring him back. And he did it. <laughs> now, notice. Well, he said, uh, John said, I like to see him. All right, we don't even let him sit around here. <laughs> we don't let him have none of these missions or things around this country. We outlawed that a long time ago. He had to go to Amon to get him. All right, so they said, said go fetch that fanatic. So, here, and so all the celebrity got around him, you know, and kind of told that fellow, the runner, the officer, what to tell him. So little old Micah sat over there reading the Bible, whatever he was, pulled up the scroll and said, yep, that's it. I have a strange feeling today, but that's what it says, amen. I believe it, Lord. I don't care how funny it looks, but I believe it anyway. <laughs> that's right, Lord. What did you say? What do you read the eyes? Isaiah prophesied the prophets and said so and so. He said, I believe that. I believe that, Lord. That's right. Somebody knocked at the door. I'm the king's bodyguard. Well, come on in. Are you Micah? I am. Are you that fanatic they talk about? Oh, I suppose I am. <laughs> well, I've got an order here to take you to the king. Well, you don't have to handcuff me. I'll walk along with you. Now, he wants you to prophesy. Oh, he does. Huh? They had a great meeting down there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, all the prophets come together, whole denomination. Everybody come together. Oh, they are having a great time. Yes, they are. What they do? Oh, the king. You know, Jehoshaphat? The Jehoshaphat has come down to see Ahab? Oh, I see what the Lord is talking about. Oh, he did. Uh huh. Yeah. What's the world Jehoshaphat doing down there? That backslider. See? That borderline dishwater weak and little wishy washy. <laughs> what is he doing down there? Thank you, his heart. Well, what did they do? Well, of course, you know that the king has made a great denomination after you kicked out of him. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but you know, Jehoshaphat, he's from a no more illiterate group up there, see? And he doesn't know just like King Ahab does down here. So, you know, King Ahab's a great man. Yeah. And Jehoshaphat was down there a while ago, and King Ahab wants him to go up to the Ramoth Gilead up there to meet the enemy. And all the prophets with all the whole school come out. And they, everyone prophesied, saying, Thus says the Lord, go up, the king's with you. And the Lord's with you. And everything's with you. So you're bound to win. And you know what? It's so positive that Zedekiah has made himself two big iron horns. He put them up on his head and run through the street hard. By these, by these, you're going to push Syria come back into the place. By these horns. Real prophets, you know. Never mind. They got everything. That's just about like a lot of oil and blood running out of their hands. There's no scripture to it. That's right. Amen. About all this your nonsense that's going on today in the Pentecostal ring. That's right. A lot of it. Not scriptural, so stay away from it. There it is about all this stuff saying it's the church, it's the church and not the Bible. If it ain't the Bible, keep away from it. Amen. It's the Word. Right. Now, these fellows sat down and after a while they met a group and they said, Now look here, Micah. You want to stand in good with this group? If you do, you must say the same thing that the rest of them say. See? You just say, prophesy, and tell you to blow them up, and everything's going to be all right. Just agree with them. And I'll tell you what, you're going to be the state 
overseer thing. <laughs> or you'll be something like that. Oh, he, he'll, he'll put your position if you'll just say the same thing they do. <clears throat> Micah says, My God liveth, I'll only say what he says. Amen. Amen. Ah, that's what we need. Amen. That's what the America needs. Yeah. I'll say just what God says, no less or no more. That's right. Amen. So Micah knew that Elijah, the prophet of God, a true genuine prophet, had prophesied evil against Ahab. So how else could there ever come anything else out of it but evil? So Micah, these other fellows had the minority, majority rather, but Micah had the word. Amen. <laughs> so that's what makes a difference, the word. Praise no matter how big the people are, how many, the communists and how many of this and how many unbelievers and the skeptics and the, and the great things today, no matter how big they are, it's what God is. Amen. It's what the word says. Amen. If they call you a fanatic, if they call you a soothsayer, if they call you whatever they want to, what difference does it make? Amen. You don't pay attention to man. If your hopes is built on man, then you're lost to begin with. Because right. oh, he's a failure, born in a failure, can't be nothing else but a failure. Right, amen. But my hopes is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood with righteousness. Amen. When all around my soul gives way and he's all my hope and faith. Yeah. On Christ's solid rock I stand all other ground, the sinking sand, yeah. Eddie Pruitt sand, and his fault in his song. <laughs> That's right. Notice, Micah had the word. You know what that word said. How can he bless this fellow when the prophet of God had thus saith the Lord and had cursed that fellow? How can we expect blessings to come out of things out of unbelievers and, and things for God has put his curse upon him? How can you do it? Fear of man. Place your door in your position. This side or the other. How can you do it when God has cursed that thing? Put your hopes in Christ. Put your faith in his word. Yes. Stand there regardless of what said yes or no. Stay with God's word. Now, closing, listen. Micah come up there before the king. Now I can imagine the king's face red. This little old ragged looking guy come walking up in there, you know. <laughs> Looking around, seeing all these preachers standing around there, the deities. I don't think he felt alone because God was with him. Amen. Walks up there, I can see the king said, How do you do, Micah? That big face, you know, called Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat said, There's something about that guy. I, like. I don't know. He just looks pretty well to me, like he's pretty well on the line. Now, I see he hasn't got much education. He might not know all the all the great words and how to pronounce them right but i believe one thing that guy knows god so he walks up there he said micah what would you say now your word must be with the rest of them and they all say go up the lord is with you and you'll prosper he said go ahead to go on up they said that well take off See? and he said oh go on up there and prosper why see you do it <laughs> and they had thought, now that, um, he said, that just don't sound right out of that guy. <laughs> now, he, he prophesied evil. You say, come down here and say that. So I adjure you, as I always know, you tell me the truth. <laughs> he said, I said, go on out. Prosper. He said, but I've seen Israel like sheep scattered, having no shepherd. The Lord said, these have no shepherd. Let them return to their, to their uh, own home in peace. Yeah. He said, I told you, I told you, I told you that Holy Lord wouldn't say nothing but evil against me. I could just tell it. I knew before we went. Now, what was the difference? One, oh, the whole country was rallying with these prophets. But here's one man, the reason he knew he was right and he come out he was right, he was standing on thus saith the Lord. God's promise. And he knew that no matter how many preachers or how many denominations or how many kings or how many anything else or anything contrary to it, God's word will prevail. Amen. Amen. If he stand, he had to stand by himself with a whole nation against him. Amen. But he stood there alone on the word of God, Amen. knowing that 
God would keep his word. So Elijah said to Ahab when he cursed him there by the Lord and said, The dogs will lick your blood because that evil thing you've done. How could that man turn around and predict blessings when God had put a curse on there by a genuine prophet? He knew nothing could happen but evil. So he stayed on the word of God and stood alone before the whole nation with hundreds of preachers and doctors of divinity around him and everything else, but he stood alone with God. You know what that head chief captain of the priest did like that? Walked right up and pulled them horns off the top of his head and smacked Mac a right smack in the mouth. That showed his religion, didn't it? Yeah. Boy, they just muddy had a bloody draw there for a few minutes. And he said, which way went the Spirit of God when it went out of me to go to you? He said, just wait till you're sitting hiding in the cage over there. You don't know which way it went. Micah did. Micah said, I saw Israel scattered. So I looked up into heaven and I saw the great throne of God. And there was angels standing on the right hand and left hand of God. And they were holding a council. When they've seen this all happening like this, holding their council down here, remember, when something's going on down here, persecutors and laughers and fun makers, there's something going on up there too, you know. Amen. Remember that. Amen. Fix your faith on there. So then, he said, I, I saw them all having a council in heaven, and they were going before God and trying to find some way they could bring Ahab out there to fulfill, of course, the word of Elijah, the prophet. Elijah spoke it under the inspiration it had to be so. There was nothing else to stop it. So he knew it had to happen. And said, so I've seen a spirit come up before God and said, so I'll go down and I'll get in all them preachers and be a lying spirit. And I'll make them prophesy a lie. Yes. And that's the way we'll get Ahab out here and fulfill the word of God. Come on. God will. He let that evil spirit, that lying spirit, Come down and get into those preachers and anoint them and prophesy in the name of the Lord a lie. You say, then, Brother Bram, how could we ever know whether the prophecy is right or not? Line it up with the word. Amen. That's what you say with it. If it's not according to that word, don't you believe it. Yeah. I told you last night, this is God's year and Sunday. Yes. If any kind of fantastic rise where you are in this little church, whatever it is, pastors, stay with the word. Amen. Don't feed these sheep something that will kill them. Stay right with the word, for it's written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Amen. Stay with the word. See? Now, Michael knew he was right because he's with the word, and they had just a swelling popular idea. What happened? They took Michael and smote him in the mouth and took him up there and put him in prison and locked him up in the inner jails and fed him bread and water of sorrow. Said, so I'll return in peace that he has. And Elijah, uh, Micah said, if you return in peace at all, God hasn't spoke to me. That's right. He called his vision compared with the Bible. Yes. Now, that's where I want to dwell just a moment. His vision was with the Bible. Now, if it was, now the other's vision was contrary to the Bible. But Micah was with the Bible, and God's got to keep his word. Amen. Do you get it? Amen. Now, what happened to Ahab? He was killed that day, and the dog licked his blood as the sun went down out of the chariot at the pool before they washed it that night. Right. That's true. For one man who took God's word, his vision lined up with God's word, and it was perfect. The absolute truth. And now, please, closing this. A vision must line up with God's word. A preacher must line up with God's word. No matter what we think and what our, the emotions are of the country, the crowd, or whatever it is, we must line up with God's Word. Yeah. And that's the reason that I have this pendant in the first place when the Lord began to give visions when I was a little bitty baby boy. And he began to show those visions. My clergyman told me it was of the devil. But one night, it was better than ten years ago, at Greensmill, Indiana, where was there in the old camp in the my wife sitting there right there now, who was seen when the vision struck me that evening, and I sat there under it, and I said, God, I don't want to be possessed with the devil. Well, certainly not. And I told her I didn't know when I would come back. And I took off to the place to pray. And that night, by the grace of God, about ten years before that, 
about, about 15, you know, 10 or 15 years before that, when I was just a young Baptist preacher, no more than a boy, baptizing, out there in the river, hundreds of people that afternoon, my first revival, and that light come down from heaven and stood there before thousands of people. They fainted and everything years ago when I was baptizing, and a voice spoke from there and said that I would take a message around the world which would start a revival just like it did in the days of John the Baptist before the second coming of Christ. I know a bit more about it than nothing. I wrote it down and kept it. They kept it. The newspapers had it and everything. Mystic light appears over local Baptist boy, pastor, while he's baptizing in the water and all about it. And then after that time, when it comes time, the Lord Jesus sent his angel back again and tried to tell me that night when I was there praying, God, don't never let that happen to me again. You know I don't want to be possessed of the devil. You know I love you. And my clergyman tell me, and here comes the angel of the Lord and told me it was his work and he had ordained it and but it uh, sweep around the world, and when I went to the, the general overseer, one of the high Baptist men, frankly, the one who baptized me, Dr. Davis, into the Baptist fellowship, I went and told him about it. He said, Billy, you need a rest. You've had a nightmare. I said, I don't appreciate that. I'll resign the Baptist church right now. He said, you mean with your seventh grade education, and you're going to go around the world preaching the gospel? And they, I said, that's what he said, and that's what I believe. Praise the Lord. Amen. He said, don't take it that seriously, Billy. I'll take the rest of you nights. You'll feel better. I walked out. By the grace of God, I started. And now what's happened? The revival fires are burning on every hill. Around the world. When old Goliath was slain, and Israel saw, they drew their swords. That's what's happened. Man of vision. Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, Lutheran, Pentecostal, what more? When they seen that God had poured out his spirit in these last days, that signs and wonders were taking place, and the bones had done rattled and shook and kicked over the chairs until they all got together. But now city skins on them, and they're standing up like a great mighty army. Praise and man began to pull their swords and say, God, if, if glass, the biggest can be slain, then we'll cut too. And they're cutting right and left from east, from west, from north to south. And a great revival has swept the whole world. When, the, when they said it can't be done, it can't be done, it can't be done, but God did it anyhow because he promised it. He said, the things that I do shall you also, greater than this or more than this shall you do, for I go unto my Father. When he was sure on earth, he didn't claim to be a great person. He claimed only to be the, the Son of Man when he was here. He was the Son of God, yet he was the Son of Man through Mary. He was the Son of God by Mary. He was God himself by spirit. God in Christ, heaven and earth reconciled together. When earthly man born of a woman and the spirit of God dwelt into him, when the lamb and the dove came together, heaven and earth kissed each other. Hallelujah. And that's right. On that great day. And he went about. He didn't claim to be a healer. He claimed he wasn't a healer. He said, I only do as my Father shows me to do. Yeah. I can do nothing in myself. What I see the Father doing, that doeth the Son likewise. Yeah. Man stood before him, strangers to him. He knew who they were. He called them by name. He called the people by name. Did he do it? Yeah. Is that the Bible? Amen. Yeah. Is it the Bible when he said he did nothing except the Father told you? That's the scripture. Yeah. St. John 5, 19. Read that. Every word's infallible. Everything in the Bible is the truth. Notice, he did nothing, but he stayed right with the word. What did he say? These things were done that it might be fulfilled. Is that right? Amen. They could not believe because Isaiah said. Jesus said that they brought him, Matthew 8, said they brought laid to him, and all the sick and afflicted, and he healed them, and it might be fulfilled, which is spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our infirmities and bore our sickness and so forth. Everything he done was to fulfill the word of God. Amen. My brother and sister, as I say to you tonight, as your brother, in the bonds of fellowship, a citizen of the kingdom of God with you, though we be few in number tonight, and though we be just a little group, God will bless us and has blessed us and brought his great being among us. Wherever two or three are gathered in my name, I'll be in their midst. That's exactly what he said. Whatsoever they shall agree upon is touching one thing and as they shall receive it. God has promised that. Now, if that's so, then the word must be fulfilled. Jesus said, the things that I do shall you also. Did he say that? Amen. That word must be fulfilled. 
Did he say, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature? Mm -hmm. All the world, mm -hmm. the gospel, the power of the Holy Ghost, demonstrations of the power of the Holy Ghost to every creature. He said, does that mean that? How are you going to read the next line, man? These signs shall follow them that believe. Amen. In my name they shall cast out devils and heal the sick and the things that he did. How can you do it just with the letter alone? The letter won't do it alone until the word falls into the ground to produce the life that's in the word. Amen. How you hold a grain of wheat ever so dearly in your hand, you'll never get a beard of wheat off of it until you put it in the ground and it rots and brings forth another life. Right. And except you die out in yourself and your own ideas, and your own theology, and just lay down in Christ and be baptized in the Holy Spirit, rise with the Word in your heart, and if anything seems to come to you that's contrary to the Word, don't believe it. That's right. No matter what your setup is, that's exactly the way the Jews failed to see him to be the Son of God in the first place. They had all the picture drawn of how the Messiah would do, how he would come to the temple, and where he would sit, and all of that. But when Jesus came, he was contrary to it every way that they thought he was coming. He was contrary to it, and that's reason they said, Oh, that's not the way we've been taught. But God don't have to do things the way you've been taught. He does it the way he says he will in the Bible. Amen. That's right. Yeah. Them prophets in our scripture lesson tonight, they've been taught something huge. But the Bible had said something else, and Micah stayed with the Bible. Amen. Now, my contention is this. Don't, don't never, never accept anything that comes out of the Bible. See, this is the blueprint. Let it be set in order and in the Bible. And God's the omnipotent one, the omnipresent, the infant God who knows all things, and has predicted that in these last days these signs would take place. The things that he did would be done again before the coming of the Lord. He said there'd be false things rise up. And there, how are we going to deviate them? Now, there's a good question. How are we going to differentiate them from one to the other? We see things out here going on and say, yeah, this look over here. Look at this. Look at this here. See how I done? Look over here. That's right. Oh, yes, brother. I'll admit that. But tell me one time that the true word of God ever failed. You got a bunch of fantastic. So were those priests. Do you understand what I mean? Those preachers, prophets, with them horns butting around. Oh, thus saith the Lord, thus saith the Lord. But it didn't cope with the Scripture. Amen. See? But when it's absolutely coping with the Scripture, it has to come to pass. Amen. And the hour is here, brother. And it's Jambus and Jambus wished that Moses stole away man of reprobate mind concerning the truth who was foreordained of old to this condemnation, says the Bible. They could not believe and they will not believe. The Bible said that in this day that we're living out that man from old was ordained to be condemned who turned the grace of our God into lasciviousness. Do you see what I mean? Jude, fourth chapter, or fourth verse. Read and see if that isn't so. Now, Man of old, poor, dangerous, how can they be? When the Bible doesn't say they can't believe. Mm -hmm. How can we stop all that nonsense that's going on around and around? How can we do it when God said it would be? Well, then you say, well, which is right and wrong? Like Michael was with the Bible. Amen. A true spirit of God will move right with the Word. For he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. There's no doubt sick people in this building. There's not a person in here I know except my wife and daughter sitting there. And... Brother Gene, this brother here, the brother sitting right there. I believe I do know this little girl here that I believe are his daughters, and this is his son. And then there was somebody else I passed by a few minutes ago that I know. Or I, I'm not sure, but the lady sitting here, uh, it, uh, uh, is that your wife? It's your wife. All right, that settles it. How many here knows I don't know you? Let's see your hand. How many here are sick and need God? to touch your body to heal you let's see your hand raise your hand I don't care what you got wrong with you raise your heart for your 60 percent for the little audience here tonight <coughs> then I want to ask you something what if Jesus Christ did you tonight with the suit as I've often said he gave me what would he do if you were sick and you wanted to be healed what would he do about it what could he do about it there's only one thing he could do was stay right with the word is that right? Amen. Stay right with the word. What does the word say? Uh, there'll be a man rise up who will have oil in his hand. And you'll rub this oil. No, that ain't the scripture. Mm -hmm. What does it say? There'll be high bishops 
And then the authority to be said, they'll be the one who said, No, oh, no. They are the sons of God led by the Spirit of God. Amen. What we say about divine healing? He was wounded for our transgressions. With his stripes we were healed. Amen. It's a finished work. What if any man desires salvation? Who could give it to him? The Pope? The Bishop? The Cardinal? No, sir. No, sir. The Pope of Rome could have nothing to do with it. Uh, the uh, Archbishop of Canterbury had nothing to do with it. None of the rest of them. Is, none of them could have nothing to do with it. It's your own individual personal faith in the finished work of Christ at Calvary. Amen. That's the Bible. That's what the Bible says. Amen. If I'll go to the Pentecostal church, will I be saved? If I'll do what the Pentecostal does? No, sir. You won't be saved. You'll be an impersonator and a hypocrite by doing it. Right. You get saved to do what God tells you to do. Not try to act like the rest of them does. You do what God tells you to do. Amen. And your experience must line up with God's Bible. Amen. If it doesn't, then you're wrong yet. No. So if I'm a Presbyterian, do I have to join the Pentecostal church? No, sir. You certainly do not. The only thing you have to do is come to Jesus Christ and accept him as a finished work. And then when you, your faith is recognized as him, he'll give you the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Here's the formula, if you want to know it. Like the first, when the first church was inaugurated on the day of Pentecost, they were all screaming at Jesus and said, Don't you preach no more, don't you do it? But Luke 24, 49 said, Tell you in the city of Jerusalem until you're due with powers on high. After this, the Holy Ghost, Acts 1, 8, after this, the Holy Ghost come upon you, then you shall be witnesses of me in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and the most parts of the world. Yeah. They went up there how long to wait how long? Two days, five days, until. Yeah. What happened? It was all in one place, in one accord. Yeah. One accord. It wasn't already, now I'm a Sanhedrin. I, I'm a Pharisee. No, it'll never come on a group like that. Not a bit. Never come. They're just waiting. There were brothers and sisters together, women in there with them. They were all up there for ten days waiting, waiting, one accord, just reading the Bible. Hello, maybe someone stand up and preaching like I've just done, saying the blessings of God has been promised. Now, God said he had poured out the Holy Ghost. Joel said he would do it. And we're waiting for the word to be fulfilled. Oh, oh my. So are you doing that tonight? Oh, waiting for the word to be fulfilled. How that struck fire to my heart. Waiting in the upper room. Well, it never happened yesterday. It will today. Or if it don't today, it will tomorrow. We'll stay right here till it's over. We're going to wait. Now the Word said so, and every spot of Jesus' life was a fulfilling of that Word. He told us to wait there before we went to preach the Gospel all the way around the world, and that every creature on the earth hear the Gospel. Before we started, we were to wait here. We were to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. One of them said, now, just a minute, there's just a little thought in my mind. Have we walked with him hand to hand? That is right. But he said, yet a little while and the world won't see me no more. Yet ye shall see me, for I'll be with you even in you. Amen. Well, now, that's right. He did say that. Amen. And he's going to be in us. Yes, sir. That's the word. Stay with us. That's Amen. Amen. All right. Here they come. All of a sudden, now, here's the way we take it. Not for joke now. I don't, this is no place for joking. There's been too much Hollywood evangelism today, too much joking and carrying on to both it. Listen, this is a sincere thing, and notice, and a sacred thing. Notice what happened after this. If we take it like today, what if we were uh, taking the Catholic Church? Now, we have to read Acts 2 like this. And they were all in one place, in one accord, making confessions, and they prayed to, prayed to the blessed saints. Mm-hmm. It's a high form of spiritualism, of course, you see, because nothing can pray to the dead except spiritualism. Right. So then, we well, they pray into the blessed saints. The priest come in and gave them the Holy Communion, the Holy Eucharist, which is called in the Greek word, and the people would lick out their tongue and take the Holy Eucharist, and they would drink the wine. Now, that's the way we go in and take the rites of the Catholic Church. Now, don't Protestants laugh, because pot can't call kettle black. What do we do? We get up and walk up to the platform and take the hand of the preacher and shake hands with the preacher, and they put our name on the book. Make a confession, say, we believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Every devil in hell believes the same thing in public truth that happens. Amen. Right. Put your name on the book. That's the way we got it. What, I condemn it? 
because it's not lined up with the Word of God. Amen. That's right. They were all in one place in one accord. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven like a rushing mighty wind. Not a priest coming up or a minister coming up, but a sound of the rushing mighty wind coming from heaven. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. There you are. There's the baptism of Wiggles. They began screaming and shouting and, and speaking with jabbering lips and other tongues till the, even when they run outside screaming and going on and acting like the religious people of that day said, these men are drunk, all full of new wine. The women and all. And listen, my sister, if God required the Virgin Mary to have such an experience like that before she come into heaven, how are you going in without the same thing? Amen. The Virgin Mary was with him. Think that over just a little bit. We're lining up with the Word. That's exactly right. Is it true? Amen. Amen. Certainly it is. And when they were all noised abroad and they were speaking every man to this group, maybe it was Italians, and here's a, here was another man, here was a Galilean speaking Italian language to this bunch of Italians telling them of the resurrection. They said, why do we hear in our own tongue the great works of God? Well, how do we hear every man in our own tongue where we were born? Aren't they Galileans? And how do we hear them in our own language? They said, this puzzles me. There's great works of God going on. Amen. Now, I'm not lacking some of our modern meanings, a bunch of carrying on where there was no, nothing to be understood, but they heard them in their own language wherein they were born. <coughs> Notice, every man in his own language wherein he was born. Amen. They were listening. They said, isn't this marvelous? See, and others mocked and said, ha, look at them. They're so drunk they don't even know what they're doing. They were reeling and staggering like drunk men under the in mighty impact of the mighty God. The great unction, which means in the Greek word dynamite, was in their soul that had blowed out the roots of carnality, and the Holy Spirit had settled in their heart. There they were. And others began mocking. But Peter, kind of coming to himself a little, he jumped up on a soapbox stump, whatever it was, and he said, Ye men of Galilee, and you that dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and hearken to my word. Listen to me a minute. Give me an audience. These are not drunk as you suppose. See, it's just the third hour of the day. Slews wasn't even open yet. See? This is just the third hour of the day. He said, but this is that. Amen. Amen. <laughs> this is that. If this ain't that, I'll keep this till that comes. Amen. Amen. So this is that. Which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. Was Peter a right kind of a preacher? Yeah. Absolutely. Where did he go to? Some theology or some great something or other? Some man who made up? No, sir. He went straight to the word like Micah did. Yeah. This is that which is spoken of by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last day of death. God, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Amen. This is that, he said. Yeah. Now, that is the point. That's it. This is that God had spoken, God had said it, God had confirmed it, and the people are laughing at it and making fun of it. Well, we got back to that place again. Mm -hmm. Tonight, just before the F of the time again, when hanging yonder in Moscow tonight is a rocket hanging there with bombs hanging in it like this, that any minute they can direct it anywhere in the United States they want to and never leave Moscow. She's got a rocket that shoots the thing, you time it with the stars and with the radar. And they can shoot it, and it'll shoot maybe 1,000 miles, and another rocket explodes, shoot her on another 1,000 miles. I pass right by the lines in Finland, where the Russian guards with a machine gun on me, hold me like this, keep me from looking on the inside through a little wall that was homemade like that for 50 miles, and like to suffocate in there with the Russian guards. One more up there, I've seen them Russians come out behind there and grab them fans around and hug one another and kiss them. Them real Christian brothers over there, brother, Christianity is the answer. Amen. That's right. Certainly is. And going through those places, there they could time that bomb and throw it into Chicago and blow Sturgis from off the map for the same thing. Amen. And never leave Moscow. All laying right in the hands of sinful, godless man tonight. That's right. And they don't even try to run. They ain't going to do no good. One of those hydrogen bombs, we have in direction out, and you have here your, your air watching thing. When that bomb hits 15 miles each way, it grows, blows a hole in the ground 175 feet deep for 15 miles. That's 30 miles square any way it falls, just one bomb. Then it'll go out and for miles and miles and miles beyond that busting trees and tearing things and just turn it back to dust and back to cosmic light. 
That's what's happening. No wonder the Bible said, in the last days it shall come to pass. What is it? There will be signs in the heaven above, flying saucers for even the Pentagon and all. Don't know what to think of it. Fearful sights in the sky. Man's heart failing, fear, perplexed at time, distress between the nations, the sea roar and tidal waves, earthquakes in diverse places, and man shall be heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, and despisers of those that are good. You say, that's communists. No, that's preachers. That's religious people. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Turn away. Amen. Lift up your heads, your redemption's drawing on. Yes. Amen. Men and women, my brothers and sisters, after preaching the gospel practically five times around the world, seems sight. <laughs> it's not even good be good to talk to you about. But I know something within me, I don't know when. No one else does. But I believe the coming of the Lord is at hand. Amen. We're near. Jesus Christ is meeting in his little group. I'll be with you. I'll confirm the word. And tonight the Bible says that he's the same yesterday, day, and forever. If we're here together, then he's got to be here. Amen. And if he will appear here in this audience and do the very same things that he did when he was here on earth, well, all of you have a heart full of faith and promise him, how I'll stay right with your word, Lord, and rewrite your word and follow it. Will you do it if you raise your hand, no matter who you are, but you believe. God bless you. Let us pray. Now, Lord, it's just a few moments. I have spoke at length in a long time, but knowing I don't know when we'll ever meet again this side of heaven. There may be some here will be gone if I should return back in a few months. I don't know, Lord, but one thing that I want to know when I stand there at that hour, that you'll say it well done, my good and faithful servant. If a man has to stand alone, all right, Lord. Tender college, why should we care? What do we care anyhow? You hold our life right in your hands. Oh, God, be merciful. I pray that you'll bless this little audience and all that's in here, Lord, as your servant. Just trying to take a little rest before these big meetings coming in, a little nervous. And, and I pray now that you'll quieten the spirits of the people in here and settle them to a true faith and anoint your servant, Lord, just now with your great Holy Spirit that you sent back. He shall testify of me and will show you things to come. The works that I do shall you do also. And Lord, may it be so tonight that men and women who are sitting here will recognize the, your presence. Now you promised it, Lord. It's according to your word that I've just spoke. No matter how, how foolish it might seem to the carnal mind, it's the foolishness of preaching to save those, them that are lost. And I pray, Father God, that you will just let your presence come into our midst now to fulfill the word. Wherever two or more are gathered in my name, I'll be in their midst. And whatever they agree upon is touching one thing and shall ask, they shall receive. Now, Father dear, the greatest thrill that I could think of tonight is for you to appear in our midst. We poor people who don't have very much of this world's good, we scrape the barrel many times to feed our babies. And there's sickness among us, Lord, and these troubles among us. And we want you to come to encourage us, Father, to fulfill your word. Now, you said that the Holy Spirit, when he comes, he would do the same things that you do. Now, if you just do that, Father, tonight, let him come as I yield myself as professing to be your servant, and these people yield theirself, may everyone see your blessed presence moving among them. And do the things tonight in our midst, just like you did before your crucifixion, so that we know then the, if there would have to be an unbeliever among us, that would know that the resurrection is sure and the truth. When you followed Cleopius and them, all day talking to them, when you got them inside, you shut the door and done something just the way you did it before you were crucified and they knew you were the risen Lord. 
When they went on their road home, they said, Did not our hearts burn within us? And may it happen here tonight. For it would only fulfill your word. Now as your servants, we surrender our hearts and will to thee. In Jesus' name, amen. Is there someone here who would say, Brother Branham, before you go any farther, I wish you'd pray for me. I know that I am not just where I should be with Christ. And I truly want to be a real Christian. If you went down here to the store, and you or the cafe, and they gave you a bowl of soup, and you started to take it, and there was a spider in that soup, by no means would you take that soup. Oh, you'd take it into the waitress and go to the manager and how you would go on. Because the soup isn't right. Why, it might kill you if you eat it. The poison of that spider might get into your system and something would set in there that would kill you. The toxin of the, of the poison of that spider would take your life. Now, what are you? What are you? Just a little petroleum and cosmic like potash and so forth held together with some atoms. That's all. You've come off the dust here. You were here when God formed the earth. Your body was laying on this earth. God brewed you together by the Holy Ghost and gave you your choice. You want him to raise you up in the last days? You want him, you old people know that the best of our days is gone? You know what you'll be when you're raised up? Not an old person, but in your best. This is what death does to you. Give you gray hair and shrink you down. <coughs> That's death setting when you're about 25 years old. Between 22 and 25, it helps. Death sets in and then we start burning down. No more how much you put fuel in your body, renew your life every day by eating, by the dead substance, that you're going down anyhow. No matter who you are, you're burning right down. It's just, it's, they, you're just going to ashes. Just like you see a pipe rusting, it's just, it's just burnt ashes just going right back. And that's what you are, burning right back. But God painted a picture. When you used to eat food, you got big and strong. That young, beautiful girl, Dad, that you led down on its mother tonight. Bless your heart, and you read that old Bible laying on the desk, and one morning you woke up and that beautiful little girl had wrinkles in her eyes. He said, Mother, you're getting close to 30. He said, Maybe you rocked the baby last night too long, Mommy. No, the uh, death set in. She said, Dad, put her arms around and I said, I noticed, honey. Oh, I just hate to see it, Dad, but that, that was the great hair around your brow. What is it, Mother and Dad? You're dying. That's right. No matter how well you eat, you're dying anyhow. How many shots the doctor gives you, you're dying anyhow. It's appointment. You're going to die. After a while, here you are all over and shaking. Soon you're going back to the dust. You're gradually turning back. Your body's going right on back to the dust all the time. Finally, it shall spread out over the earth. But the same God who brought you together from the earth in the first place has given you a promise with an oath to himself. He that heareth my words and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. And shall never come into the judgment, but pass from death to life. Now, he that eats my flesh and drinks my blood, that's worthily. Hath it not as a sinner, not as an agnostic or an unbeliever, a lukewarm church member, but worthily. Remember, First Corinthians 11, that must be from a Holy Ghost-filled heart. Try and see. I'll raise him up in the last day. I'll raise him up. That's the word of God. There I rest, not on whether I jumped or whether I shouted, whether I spoke with tongues, whether I had oil in my hands, or whether I preached or what I done, I'm resting on that promise. Satan can beat me around the stumps on my feet, <coughs> but he can't on the word because it's thus saith the Lord. That's where Jesus defeated the devil. Right there he said, it is written and shall not bear about that alone. Stay with the word. Now he promised to be here. If he comes here and meets with us, and you're all in sick people, about 60% of this little group here, maybe 50 or 75 people, whatever, sitting here. Not knowing any of you, what if Jesus stood here now, just like I'm saying? And you said, Lord, I'm sick, will you heal me? What would he have to say to keep his word? I've already done it. I've provided. You say, will you save me, Lord? I have already provided that. When were you saved? You say, Oh, six months ago. Oh, no. Ah, you were saved when Jesus died. He took away the sins. Were only you just accepted your personal faith and was saved by your own personal faith in him. Will you acknowledge him tonight as you raise your hand and say, God, be merciful to me. Brother Brandon, pray for me. Will you do it before we start the rest of the meeting? 
But if there's anybody here, I don't know your heart. You might be a sinner. I don't know. If you're a lukewarm church member, you're the most miserable person in the world. You're sitting on a borderline, such a place that, oh, I, you know you're not right. You can't be. Jesus said, except the man be born of the Spirit and water, water and Spirit, rather, he will in no wise enter in. And no man can say Jesus is the Christ only by the Holy Ghost. He that heareth my words and believeth on him sent me. The Holy Ghost has to give a personal witness of the resurrection of Christ. You have to have it. Now, I'll be glad to join with you in prayer to save you. I couldn't. No one else can. It's your own personal faith. That's the Holy Spirit. And you cannot do it unless God chooses you. You have no choice of your own. No, sir. You, this Bible says in Romans 8 chapter, it's not him that willeth or him that runs. Whether you want to be saved or whether you don't want to be saved, it's God that shows mercy. Amen. He called, told us that I hated Esau and loved Jacob before they was even conceived in their mother's womb. Or is ever born to make a choice. It's God that does the choosing. And what a privilege it is for the King of Kings to offer you back, to go back to a young lady or a young man and live forever, not an angel, but a human being. God made you a human being to eat, drink, love, and the senses that you have. He made you that, and then to turn him away and reject it. What a foolish thing it would be. Let's bow our heads just again. Would you raise your hand now with your head now while Christians are praying? Pray for me, Brother Brandon. I want to be a real, real Christian. God bless you. God bless you, lady. God bless you, sir. God bless you, sir. Someone else. Pray, God bless you, lady. God bless you, sir. Pray for me. I remember me now in prayer, Brother Brown. Not without any emotion, without anything, just moving up quietly before God to keep his promise. Heavenly Father, about seven or eight hands raised up towards heaven. You who are omnipresent at this time, you know all about that. I pray that you'll write their names in your book. You said, No man can come except my Father draws him, and all that comes I'll give him everlasting life. I pray, God, that that was from the very depths of their heart that they're tired of a lukewarm profession or, or either whatever they are, a sinner, and coming to you. I pray that you'll forgive every sin and every trespass and give to them the baptism of the Holy Spirit with springs of joy in their hearts and anoint them and send them into the field of service as the day is in me. Grant it, Lord. I pray this prayer with all sincerity. In Christ's name as I present them to thee. Amen. A word for the handkerchiefs. And then, Father God, these handkerchiefs, they go into sick people. You know where they're going. I pray that you will heal each of them. In Jesus' name, amen. That's not at least two that's crowding up here to have a prayer line. Let's let it go. I want you to look this way. I want to be I want you to be honest with me as a minister of the gospel, as this Bible is before me. If you're sick and you have does the Bible say I'll give you scriptures now, does the Bible say that Jesus is the high priest of our confession? Does he say it? Yeah. Hebrews three? Yeah. All right. Does the Bible say in the New Testament? that we can touch Jesus as the woman touched him, his garment, just touched his garment and went off, stood in the crowd, and Jesus turned around and said, Who touched me? And they said, Why, well, all touched him. Everybody denied him. But his great discernment of spirit, he went right straight to where she was and told her exactly what was wrong. Did, he, she, did that happen? Certainly. Does the Bible say that he is now the high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities? Is that right? Amen. How would we be recognized then if he has already done the work? That question is just like he gives to the Jews in his days. If who do you say that Christ is, said the son of David, said, Why did David in the spirit and call him Lord? <laughs> The Lord said unto thy Lord, my Lord, set thou on my right hand, that I may expose the footstool. Then how is it, if he has already finished our works, for uh, the works of grace, 
for our faith to accept him as a healer because he has purchased our healing, how can he still be a high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities? He has to make a way out. And the only way he done it, based on Hebrews 13, 8, that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and when he went away, his works was to be carried on in his church until he returned. Is that right? Amen. He said, we are the vine, we are the branches, he is the vine. Is that right? St. John 15, chapter. I am the vine, ye are the branches. And every branch that bringeth forth fruit is pruned and fixed up and so the purge so will bring more, but the branch that doesn't bear fruit is fucked off. Now, the branches is the one that bears fruit, not the vine. So we, the church, is left as the branches. So your eyes and my eyes is the only eyes that God has on the earth. Your lips and my lips is his, is his branch. He energizes it to bring forth fruit. And our ears is his ears. Our hands to do good is his hands. Our feet are his feet to carry us to church to do good. Blessed are the feet that bring or carry us good time. And all, all such, we are his vines, and he just pours his energy into us. Now, there's five gifts that set into the church. Apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists, pastors. That's the branches. And God pours his energy into that. Some of them to preach. Some of them to be evangelists. Some to be pastors, teachers, seers. And apostles or missionaries, either one, both the same, same word. Now, if he's raised from the dead and he's here tonight, then why would he, what would he do if he stood here? He would look upon you. He'd know you. He'd know you just as he knew Peter, called his name, and know the others. He'd know what you had need of in your heart like he did the woman at the well. He told her, he talked to her a few minutes till he found her trouble. Said, go get your husband. She said, I don't have any husband. Said, you got five. She said, sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. We know when the Messiah cometh, he'll do these things. Is that right? Amen. St. John 4. But who are you? He said, I'm he. She ran and said, isn't this the Messiah? Isn't this the great sign of the Messiah? So did Philip say the same thing when he brought Nathaniel up? Nathaniel, when he said, you, why, well, he saw him when he was under the tree praying the day before, 30 miles around the mountain. How did he do it? Well, he said, you're the son of God, the king of Israel. But what did the big Orthodox church say? That's the devil. Jesus said, you say that against me, you'll be forgiven. But when the Holy Ghost is coming, he energizes. Speak one word against it, and it'll never be forgiven in this world or the world come. There you are. Now, I humbly ask you to submit yourself. I ask you to never get this. I am not a healer. And there's no other man that's a healer. I ask you to give your spirit holy to God and look towards heaven and say, God Almighty, I am in need. And I'm asking you some way that I recognize to increase my faith that you will appear here and prove by that little scripture that you're with us and doing the same work that you did and just speak to me. And I don't know whether it's true or not because I, I know you don't know. Your spirit will bear record with his spirit as Jehoshaphat did when he seen Micah. Now, pray. Don't, don't be skeptic. If you do, you'll never speak. You get sincere and believe, as I get sincere and believe, and the Lord had his blessing. And a little sister at the piano, if you were just a little song, you say, why the song? Well, why did Elijah say, bring me a minstrel to bring the spirit of God upon him? But if I didn't respect the presence of Jehoshaphat, he wouldn't even look at you. He said, but nevertheless, he got all stirred up. He was rebuking Jerome, Ahab's son. And he said, if it wasn't for the presence of Jehoshaphat, I wouldn't even look at you. But bring me a minstrel. He got there. He quieted himself down. And the minstrel played. The spirit came up on the prophet. Is that right? right. You say abide with me, will you softly? While we all, not everyone, just keep right in your seat. Just keep reverent before God. And remember, we're in his presence. I've talked as way long. Now, a one word from him will do more than all the words I could say. And if he will return tonight in here, when I know he's here, because that's his word, I'll stay right with it. If he will return and do the same thing that he did at the well with the woman, 
or with Philip or with any any place else, if he'll turn and do the same thing, will every one of you recognize him and believe him and, and go out when you know it's right in the Word, not some mythical, something what somebody else has said, but what God has said, what his promise has said, his Word has said, call it sister. Now be reverent and just be in prayer, or just waiting. Now, when it's a massive people, many times I call prayer lines so that the that the people would come up and be prayed for. I could get one single person, but you just a little group. Sometimes before, maybe like in India, five hundred thousand, or in Africa, maybe two hundred thousand, and thousands like that. You know? A uh, little, little prayer line starts so the anointing gets started. It's your faith that does this vision. It's your faith. Jesus didn't say, I know anything about it. She touched him and then he recognized it. Now you touch him tonight and see if he'll recognize you. Just pray. Just pray and God of heaven, be merciful to us. For now abide with us, Father. And we have brought your word just as humbly as I know how to bring it. At length, Paul preached one time all night on the same Lord Jesus. And a boy fell out and killed himself, and Paul laid his body over him, and life come back again. And now, Lord God, we pray that you'll appear to us tonight for these people who have accepted you, these seven or eight people that raised their hands, we pray that you'll let them see now that it's not some dead creed, it's not some Buddha, or some Mohammed, or or Jan or some other religion it's a true religion religion of Jesus Christ the Son of God who is not dead but is alive tonight in our midst you promised you'd meet with us Father and we know you are here if we step prayerfully if you wish to close your eyes alright if you do not you don't have to but just be in prayer you remember the angel of the Lord, the picture of it is here in the book, very bad picture, where the scientists and the FBI and all has examined it hanging down here in Washington, D.C., copyrighted. Can you remember seeing that picture? If you do, say amen. That angel of the Lord, that light that appeared on the river yonder, that's been tucked by many newspaper photographers in Germany here a few weeks ago, they just scattered all over Germany. When the big German camera caught it coming down, that light isn't two foot from where I'm standing. Is that right? What is it? Jesus Christ. Light? Yes. Anyone knows that it was Jesus Christ who led the children of Israel in a pillar of fire, a light. He said, I come from God, I go to God. And while he was here on earth, he was a man. He turned back and went to God. He appeared to Mary. He appeared to Cleopas done something, but after he ascended to God the Father, he turned back to light, and Paul, on the road to Damascus, seen him, and he was a great light that still Paul down like the sun shining. Paul, the people stood by that, never seen no light. They couldn't see him, but just as my soul begins to enter into this other world, this other realm, then the light begins to see it. I see it moving in the, as it's before me. Now I want you to pray, believe, and as you people, no matter how strange you are, I know you're not, but God does know you, and I want you to believe. Now, I have no way of knowing you, you know that, but God does know you. Now, just as you pray, I'm just watching to see what he'll say. Just touch his garment like the woman did, and have faith and believe. Here he is, standing over a lady right here in front of me, with a blue dress on, sitting by the side of a woman with a green dress on. She's holding a light blue handkerchief in her hand. She's wearing glasses. She's praying to God. And this light hangs by her, and as I see it break, and the woman moves away from me, 
and the lady is suffering with a sinus trouble. That's right, lady. Raise up your hand if that be so, so the audience can see. All right? I see someone else that appears by you. It's an aged person. It's a woman. Very sick. I see a long street coming. I see a little girl in a... Oh, it's your mother that you're praying for in your prayer. And your mother is seriously ill. And her examination shows that she has diabetes and a cancer also. And you're afraid for your mother. And you're praying to God now to help your mother. That is true. Now, if that is true, I want you to raise to your feet just a moment. If them words are true. I want you to look this way. I don't know you, do I? Never seen you. Whatever what was said is true. Is that right? I wouldn't know it at this time because it's on the record. Now, the best I can remember it was your sickness and the tears that you wiped from your eyes on that handkerchief. You lay it on the one that you love. And Heavenly Father, I ask that you will bless and grant this woman's request. Her faith has touched thee. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The Lord grant you, sister, whatever your desire is. Now, did the woman touch me? No, sir. She's eight or ten feet from me. But she touched something. Is that right? Then the scripture is fulfilled. He's a high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. So right. If thou canst believe, all things are possible. Bible, we just keep praying. I hear all praying. I'm just waiting on the Holy Spirit. I'm just yielding myself as you are, your faith. If I be God's prophet or his servant, brother, surely he'll answer your prayer. <clears throat> the Bible said, If thou canst believe, all things are possible. All things. I'm just watching to see if he will appear, our blessed Redeemer. He knows all things. We hope, believe, and trust. <coughs> Little lady, since you dropped your head right back here, you're so sincerely watching and waiting. You, you kept watching me to see what my emotions would be. I'm a stranger to you, am I not? But you are, know that there's something around you that's not a not human. You're aware of that. I've never seen you in my life. You're a stranger. Do you believe me to be his servant? Do you believe what I've told you is the truth? Now see, the way you get to a gift, it's your, it's your approach to it. One time when Jesus was talking to the people, a woman touched his garment, she felt their shoes. But a Roman soldier put a rag on his head and hit him on the head and said, If you can see visions or prophets, I tell me who hit you. He didn't see a little virtue, it's your approach. So God will tell me what your need is. Then if you're in contact with the Spirit of God now, will you believe? 
then that pleurisy would leave you. It's right, isn't it? You've got more faith than really you thought you had. Now you really know that something's anointing you now. When I said that, that just boosted your faith. Wasn't that right? Now you look at me as God's prophet. You're not from this city. You're not from around here. You come from a big place. It's Detroit. Right. Elizabeth is your name. Your last name's Marshall. <clears throat> Do you believe on the Lord Jesus now, lady? See, as you contact his spirit, how he moves right back down to you, that, it doesn't heal you. It only gives you a contact of the spirit. Now I get her to doubt. Some of the rest of you might, but not her. Neither did Nathaniel doubt. Neither did the woman doubt who the miracles done on. Neither did the woman at the well doubt. Had to be moved over to you, sister, sitting over there in the corner. You believe the Lord heal that back trouble and let you get well, make you well? You're praying for that, wasn't you? Raise up your hand if that's true. <laughs> All right, receive what you've asked for. May God in heaven grant it to you. My sincere prayer. I believe that's that the man sitting at the door. The man wearing no it isn't, it's a woman. It's right ahead of him. There stands the, that angel of the Lord that lights around the woman. Don't fear, sister. The Lord Jesus will make you well. Give you the desire of your heart to him. Your name's Alice, isn't it? Granger's your last name. Have faith in God, don't doubt. There's a young man sitting. He's wearing a red coat or a red sweater. He's got his finger against his mouth. He's praying for someone which is dear to him. It's his father. He has cancer. You believe, young fellow, that God would heal your dad? You do? Are you aware that Jesus Christ... How did I know what the man was praying for? I saw him in a vision standing and I heard his prayer. He who hears prayer answers prayer. God is the answer of prayer. Are you conscious of his presence now while he's here? While the anointing is up on you all, do you want to be healed? Do you wish to be healed? Do you believe me to be his servant? I say to you that Christ is in our midst. Ask these people. I never know them. Now it's breaking over. Just have faith right now. Just put your hands on each other. This is the scripture. The Bible said they shall lay hands on the sick. I'm afraid to go any farther now, because the Holy Spirit seems to say, pray for them. Keep your hand on your baby here, lady. All right? Be in prayer. Now, everybody, oh, abide with me. We're inviting you into our little bark, Lord, our little house. Not much. We've mistreated it so, Lord, but you're God, and we pray that you'll bless this little audience just now. Thou hast come down and proven your word, that you stay with the word. The word shall never fail. You said heavens and earth will pass away, but my word shall never fail. 
nothing can stop your word from failing. Or could ever make it fail. Rather, there's one thing that's impossible. That's for God to fail. For the Bible says He cannot fail. And you are the Word. You in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was made flesh and dwells among us in our hearts and our beings. When they thought they could destroy it by placing him in a tomb, driving a spear through his heart. But watch the Spirit of God making a way by an angel, rolling away the stone in gravitation, losing his power when the Son of God rose steadily from the earth to the sea. Preaching to his disciples and commissioning them to preach to all the world and all ages the gospel and you'd be with them and they'd do the same thing that you did. You'd be with them would make yourself knowing at every age among all people. And here you are tonight, Lord, in this little group. You humble yourself to fulfill your word, God. No matter how humble word is, you will keep your word. We thank thee, Lord. Thou hast promised that you've healed us we believe it, we accept it with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind. We believe that you are Jesus, the Son of God, right here in our midst. And we accept the great